from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Sandy Johnson talking about production practices for adding economic value to springborn beef calves as weaning and marketing time approaches. She draws from a recent analysis of calf buyer preferences and the premiums paid for such practices. Then K-State's Dale Blassie We'll discuss the procedures for treating wheat straw with anhydrous ammonia to create an additional forage resource for cattle. That was part of a podcast session recently with K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney. Today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Update features Extension Agricultural Agent Shad Marston of McPherson County. And K-State's Ward Upham joins us for this week's horticulture segment further ahead on this Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in. This is Agriculture Today. We'll address you cow-calf producers with spring-born calves on the first part of today's broadcast. As you might be looking to the point at which you will market those calves, potentially, this fall, perhaps very late summer, depending on your program, Ways of adding value to those calves is what we're about here as we're joined by beef cattle specialist Sandy Johnson, K-State Research and Extension from her office in Colby, northwest Kansas. Sandy's going to tap into some really great information that was gathered not that long ago, Sandy, by researchers out of K-State on uh, sale data that would indicate what premiums buyers pay for certain characteristics then those calves put up for market. A tremendous resource, isn't it? Yes. What they've done is, since uh, we've been more computerized, been able to take advantage of some of the records associated with the Superior Video Auction. And so they have, I don't know, 83,000 different lots of calves and average lot size is about 88 head, you know, so you, you've got a lot of information there. And when I look at somebody that says, well, I don't sell on Superior, okay, I, I understand there's a lot of other markets. But what this allows us to do with a relatively large data set is look at some things that are happening over time. And it, it helps us to see some of the variation in what people are paying money for. And so while it may not be your exact market, I think there's some opportunity to look at that and say, are there opportunities for me to market my calves in a different way that might get me some greater return? And it just gives you a little better idea of what some of that value might be, the range in value. We know that the price isn't going to be consistent, but if you're just trying to go to the sale barn and, oh, it sounds like green calves with purple tails are bringing more money today, that might be true, but over time, will that be the case? And uh, it's, it's really hard for an individual to take in all that information as well as a, this type of data set can. So, you know, it, it's uh, some information to apply to some of that decision making and management uh, that we might look at. Well, let's, in our conversation here, walk through some of the examples of management that could lead to added value as we're depicted out of this sale data. And, well, let's start with something that has been talked up quite frequently recent years, and that is weaning time vaccination programs ahead of the sale. Was that accounted for in this data? Yes, and one of the things is uh, looking at that trends over time in 1995, I think, is when this data set started. And if we look at what has happened with preconditioned calves over time, when this database started, roughly 40% of the calves were non-vaccinated, non-weaned, no, no particular program. In 2018, which was the last data to go into this, in 2018, those calves that received at least one viral vaccine prior to being sold make up 50% of the calves marketed. Three rounds of viral vaccine and were weaned are now 30% of the calves that go through there. So certainly the trend is the buyers are interested in those, they're being supplied, you know, the premium for that, uh, the calves have been weaned, three rounds of viral, 
have gone from two dollars and forty seven cents up to six dollars and eighteen cents over that time so that the buyers are seeing more value in that and, and willing to pay for it so yeah. it takes uh, more effort to capture that but keep in mind as you're looking at that as an option that you're also adding some weight to the calves and uh, so that that information may help people figure out what potential returns might be from a vaccinated program in their their marketing. But it really is hard to ignore that premium level um, of potentially three to four fold rise in what buyers are willing to pay for those preconditioned calves, Sandy. Right. And if you just think about risk management in today's situation, if, if I'm going to spend how much money on this lot of calves, if I can minimize my risk, you know, that's going to look better to my banker. Somewhat aligned, but it's a different subject. That is whether those calves have received growth implants or have not. Is that a variable of, to be considered here? Yeah, you know, I hear people say that, well, I, I don't want to implant them because, you know, people, they, their impression is they're paying more money for non implanted calves. Well, as you look at this data set, there's uh, three years in that data set where they're actually paying more money for implanted calves versus non-implanted. And so the and the idea that non-implanted calves are bringing you more money at this point in the market, that's not true. Now, if you put them into some other source verified program, there may be more premium with that, but not just strictly saying these are not implanted, sending them up the line. It is not getting a premium and the other part of that is one of the programs that they have looked at in the course of some of this data is non-hormone treated cattle. And of course, there's uh, several programs that kind of relate to that, whether it's natural, all natural plus, but the level of those premiums, you need a really sharp pencil to make sure that, that you're getting paid for those. And this data would indicate it might be very challenging to get return for what you're giving up to not use various technologies. It might be hard to come out in the end if you weren't in just the right market. Once you get calves sick and have to start treating some and pulling them out of that program, that's, you know, can get really expensive fast. So, you know, just some challenges. And again, uh, looking at those values can help you understand some of that variation over time and, make some decisions within your own operation. There's an article, by the way, in the Beef Tips newsletter that references a number of direct sources on some of the principles that were highlighted in this sale data survey. And uh, it's very helpful to track down specifics there that might be germane to your operation. Are there any other general preparatory principles for calves that we might want to highlight here, Sandy? Well, there's one other I'll mention related to breed that I guess I didn't recognize was happening maybe in, in the industry. That relates to Black Angus and Red Angus sired calves. We see different things if we look at the steer data or the, the heifer data. And if we look at the steer data based on breed, a Charlet sired calf would be the highest value of those calves then the red Angus and black Angus sired calves are similar in price. A little bit lower priced is English crosses and English continental crosses. And then the lowest value would be Brahmin, which wouldn't surprise us. When we go to the heifers, there seems to be a higher value placed on red Angus sired heifers over black Angus sired heifers. And the, their speculation is that that's due to buying those for replacements. Because if you look at the bread cow and heifer component of this data, that those red Angus sired heifers, bred heifers, were bringing more than the black Angus sired. And so, again, that's uh, in this particular market and that data set is uh, what it had, had to tell us. And those aren't huge differences, but they add up over time. 
once more, this data set is just extraordinarily valuable as producers might want to think about their calf management from here forward up until that sale point. And that's that's the final parting thought here, Sandy, that producers should contemplate what might work for them in terms of that added value. Right. You know, we we don't want to be stuck in a rut and we've always done it the same way. The market is changing. The premium difference between steers and heifers has been changing more within this data set, but some of the things we need to keep watching. So this is a, a good data set to look at and there's really several different it's broken down into several different pieces, so you can look at those smaller components and think about, are there ways that I might change the management of my operation to take advantage of some added premiums? And of course, we have to remember that any any changes we make are not, you know, it's not flipping a switch necessarily. So I recognize that, but uh, part of the value of this data is seeing those trends over time. And having more information to make those decisions, I think, is always better than, than less information. So hope producers can uh, study on that and see how they can take advantage of that information for their own operation. And you can link into that information in great detail, as a matter of fact, by going to the article that Sandy's put in the most recent Beef Tips newsletter out of K-State. It's entitled... Value captured from improved production practices. What does the sale data say? Calcalf operators, check all of that out. Sandy, thanks for the quick overview. As always, we appreciate your time. Glad to be here. She's a beef cattle specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That's Sandy Johnson. That newsletter is found at ksubeef.org. Again, that's ksubeef.org. The Beef Tips newsletter posted on June the 30th. We'll be back with more on this agriculture today. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Shelby Varner. Weather is always an unknown factor, and it can affect forage production yields. If a producer is looking for an additional forage resource, baling wheat straw and treating it with anhydrous ammonia might serve that purpose. Proper technique on how to ammoniate wheat straw and why producers might choose to do it was a topic on a recent podcast produced by beef system specialist Jamie Lynn Farney, where she was joined by K-State Extension Beef Cattle Nutritionist Dale Blassie. Blassie shares notable information on how and why cattle producers may choose to ammoniate wheat straw. Why might a person be interested in ammoniating wheat straw for their cow-calf operation, given kind of our current environment and projected feed supply costs? Well, Jamie Lynn, wheat straw represents a dry matter product that has excellent use based upon the last 30 or 40 years of research and actual use by our producers throughout Kansas and the, the, the major states in, the, in our beef belt. And dealing with the unpredictability of weather, precipitation, and so forth, taking advantage of the material and treating it a uh, producer has basically laid in a source of dry matter properly processed and so forth uh, that lends itself very well for efficient cow-calf production. We, we might be having some higher feed costs coming in that we need to start accounting for. A absolutely. And I, I just checked the local co-op for anhydrous ammonia, and we're looking a good round number to, to keep in mind would be about $600 a ton is what I was quoted. So we're looking at about 30 cents a pound of anhydrous as you look at either doing a half rate or at the traditional 3% rate that a lot of the research in the past has been built around. Those are good numbers to start with. Uh, now, what does ammoniating wheat straw do for the quality, digestibility, and or palatability of that feed ingredient as compared to just feeding straight wheat straw? Well, under the right environment with adequate moisture, and it's ideal to process the straw for ammoniation as soon after harvest as possible. 
trying to trap as much moisture in that wheat straw as possible to blend together that and hydrous ammonia, which it's a caustic reaction inside that plastic environment that we cover with that six to eight mil plastic. And the process with heat from the summertime applied to this is a breaking of the lignin cellulose. It creates basically a swelling of that wheat straw, which basically provides more access points to the microbes during the ruminal digestion. That coupled with the addition of the nitrogen that is present in the anhydrous, we'll typically see a two to three times increased response, if you will, to the product. So, you know, the old research would say that we're upgrading wheat straw to an equivalency of prairie hay. But we also have seen higher results with the 3% application, somewhere in that 10, maybe to 12% protein. So by doing this entire process, as I alluded to, with improving the quality of the wheat straw to prairie hay, we basically see an 8 to 15% improvement in digestibility. And with that increase in digestibility, we see greater intake. And basically, the through the, the help and assistance from the microbes in the rumen, the animal is able to derive a greater percentage of, of the true digestibility that exists in that low-quality crop residue. And you'd mentioned, you know, several different times about the process. Can you explain the process of your ammoniating your wheat straw to a higher degree? Well, as I alluded to earlier, we need heat. You need temperature. And unfortunately, in many years after the fact, many producers will call and approach me in August, September, October, when we don't have the heat units to really affect a good reaction that is required for the swelling of that of those crop residue fibers, as well as the permeation, if you will, the penetration of the anhydrous into the crop bales. And so the best time to do it is really right now with the heat of summer. The other thing that I always tell producers is that it's essential during the treatment process to keep the black plastic on the product. And during the fall and even into the early winter, it'll take anywhere from six to eight weeks for that process to occur. And living in Kansas and understanding the weather systems and so forth, trying to keep a six to eight ply plastic on a pyramided shape of of round bales, if you will, is a challenge. I have also experienced doing this process during the summer only to have a storm come through that very night and remove the plastic from a newly processed lot of bales that we process. The, The good news about that, even after one day, one night of coverage, we did go back and pull samples and look at the residual that was in there. And we did see an uptick in the amount of nitrogen in those bales. So with heat and properly prepared, the site properly prepared, there's sufficient dirt material and so forth around that stack that holds that black plastic as close as possible. You still can get a really good treatment, if you will, even I would say four to seven days, you would, you'll get something out of that process should a wind come up. And using net wrap, one thing I recommend for producers on either end of the stack to use some leftover net wrap to basically create a girdling effect around the edges at the end of either end of the stack to prevent the wind from baffling that black plastic and rubbing on the edges of those bales. That's critical because with the application of the anhydrous, initially that stack will swell like a balloon and be actually rounded until that material starts to penetrate into the interior bales that are that compose your stack that you're trying to process. The other thing that's important is to have a good general idea of what the average weight of each bale in the stack is. So you know in a ballpark what the approximate application, the total pounds of anhydrous you need to deliver. I would recommend that producers work with their local co-op and 
basically create, if you will, one tank per stack that they may create and get that tank preloaded to the amount needed to properly treat that stack. The other big cardinal rule that I would like to stress to everybody is to turn, when you start the application process, when you turn on the valves from the nurse tank into the stack, to turn it on low and keep it low. Don't get into a hurry and try to get it all done within an hour or two, which is why I recommend getting the set amount, turning it on slowly, maybe checking around the entire stack for any potential, the evidence, you'll smell it. If there's a, a visible tear in the plastic while you're setting the, the plastic over the bales, you will find that very quickly. I would keep duct tape on hand to immediately plug the holes. And once you're assured that there's no problems anywhere, I would just simply leave it. If it takes five hours, if it takes eight hours for the entire tank to dispense its contents, that would be my recommendation because it doesn't stretch the plastic as it's swelling. And you're just putting a, a good, slow application into that stack to ensure that you get maximum uptake by the wheat straw bales. And a really great video that K-State has put together about ammoniating straw, as well as a couple of our publications, has the specifics to help you with the half rate or three-quarter rate that Dr. Blasi had mentioned earlier. Yes, uh, Dr. Justin Wagner, uh, we actually did a project here back in 2014, and uh, he has a really novel way of dispensing the anhydrous, rather than going in with one hose into one the centralized location of the stack, uh, Dr. Wagner has a, a series of feeder lines, if you will, that he has uh, developed and has used quite successfully. And, and I concur with you, Jimmy Lynn. Folks need to watch that video. He does an excellent job. And really run a sharp pencil on what your calculated dry matter needs are going to be. You know, you hope for the, the best and plan for the worst is the good old adage to use. And if you do see yourself being potentially short, action is, is best taken when the situation presents itself. And, you know, we hear this more so now today about removing all the organic matter off of our fields, Jamie Lynn. And, you know, maybe doing it every year might be overtaxing to the soil. But I think doing it when you need to do it, I think it's very forgiving. And I think that provides an opportunity for the best of both worlds, if you will. That was K-State Extension Beef Cattle Nutritionist Dale Blassie visiting with K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney. To hear more on the purpose of ammoniating wheat straw and how to do it, listen to the recent Dr. J's Beef Podcast on that topic. Find that by simply searching for Dr. J's Beef. For further information, contact your local Extension Agriculture agent. I'm Shelby Varner, and we will return with more on Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today is back now. Eric Atkinson with you. And it's on to today's Kansas Wheat Harvest Report, and we'll center on harvest progress and results in McPherson County, the central part of the state. Shad Marston is the Extension Agricultural Agent there. Are your producers, Shad, back at it in the fields in the most recent days after what were likely some extended weather delays? Yes, we're still trying to finish up just a little bit, and traveling throughout uh, our county here the last just couple of days, I spotted a field or two that uh, has not been cut. Whether that's a weather delay or maybe some breakdowns, uh, yesterday morning we ran into some rain on the northern side of the county with 13 hundredths of an inch, and south of McPherson we had up to 40 hundredths of an inch of rain. And so that weather has put us off just a little bit because we've had that sprinkled out throughout uh, this harvest season. As far as what's coming out of the fields, are you seeing, well, we'll start with this, any quality losses because of the extended harvest period? I think maybe just a little bit. We've had a, a lot of problems uh, this year uh, throughout our whole growing season. We've had some hail, 
some wind and some rain, some big rains at times there when our wheat was starting to ripen and we had some fields that were water was standing in in the fields. And so we have had some quality problems. But overall, I, I think it's been a good year for most. I think in some parts of the county, it's been not as good. Uh, I've heard some reports of our, we don't have much irrigated, but a little bit of irrigated wheat that that was in the 80 plus range bushels per acre. Uh, I think our good average was in the 40s and 50s, I think mainly across our county. But I think some areas even exceeded that. I, not everybody did because we did have some 30s and where that hail pounded down there for a length amount of time. You know, we got into some 20s and even teens with some of the wheat that's been totally hailed out. And uh, I did cut to one plot already, and this is unofficial. I haven't got the moisture and the test weight. And I also take protein samples of all of our 27 varieties in our in our three wheat plots. But one that I have, Paradise, was, was one of the top ones. Uh, WB4401 was a second in bushels. Per acre, Rockstar, Hamilton, Atomic. So we had 27 different varieties in our wheat plots, and it's interesting to study them. And when I'll get the data all put together and side by side, even though that our wheat plots are not replicated, producers can still look and and see some of the differences and how it fits into maybe their program. You bet. The McPherson County Extension Office will be availing that information as soon as you can crunch the numbers. And were test weights as variable as your yields then, Chad? I think just a little bit, yes. We had some wheat that was brought in there early that was 58, uh, 59, 60, you know, close to that 61 test weight. Uh, Our moisture levels were pretty good there at the beginning. So I think producers were fairly happy with what they have. Some of them haven't seen a good above average wheat crop with this high of a wheat price. Mm-hmm. And so they were very fortunate and and blessed this year to kind of have both in some areas. And was it an average disease year for wheat in McPherson County or above average? How would you rate that? Yeah, I would say we had some uh, some major problems. We had some yellow dwarf problems in some of our areas. We had some weak streak mosaic problems in a lot of areas where we didn't control our volunteer wheat last fall, and we didn't get that killed in time. And we saw some damage, and I think we saw some yield loss, quite a bit of that, due to some of them disease problems. Mm -hmm. A lot of people put on fungicide this year, uh, whether they sprayed that on themselves or had the airplanes flying, and I sure think that helped, especially when the wheat price is what it's at now. It's good to have that harvest almost in the books, and Chad, we appreciate the input. Many thanks to you. Well, thank you, Eric. It's going to be a good summer here. Uh, We have some weather coming up that's going to be in the 80s this next week, and it's fair time, and usually it's up over 100, so we're looking forward to that. (laughs) You bet. Chad Marston with us, McPherson County Extension Agricultural Agent, with today's wheat harvest update on agriculture today. And we'll close out this segment with the Kansas soybean update. Here's Greg Akagi. Mac Marshall is joining us. He is Vice President of Market Intelligence with the United Soybean Board. And Mac, as we're halfway through 2021, it's safe to say it's been a wild ride for these soybean markets. Yeah, I think that's definitely a very safe thing to say. And we're seeing that manifested. Uh, We've seen it happen a lot over the course of the growing season thus far. The reason we're having these kind of wild swings back and forth, tailing off of expectations of weather or what gets announced in a crop conditions report is because the market is operating against this backdrop of incredibly tight supplies. And we had tight supplies through this last season. It's certainly been a story with a lot of early selling. But now we start to look into 21-22, the new marketing year starting on September 1st. We look at the acreage report, which you know, a lot of the market was looking for a lot more soybeans because we had a significant price rally, which, you know, might have incentivized more uh, beans to get in the ground. A lot more area went to corn, uh, not for soybeans. So 
I took last week's report really as a continued validation of us expecting to see tight supplies uh, through the balance of the marketing year. And with that, uh, that's all predicated on us having, uh, you know, trend yields over 50 bushels an acre, probably close to 51. So there's not a lot of wiggle room. So any incremental potential changes in weather, which would impact crop development, certainly as we're reaching July, that becomes more and more important. The markets are going to trade on that. How much does trade fit into all this uh, in the aspect of how good it has been and uh, the prospects of what we see for the rest of the marketing year? Well, trade has been, I, I think, one of the hallmarks of this season. This is a year we've seen China come back into the market in a very large way. A lot of the markets that you know we've looked to help expand during the years of the trade war, those markets are continuing to be large buyers of U.S. origin soy products. There's certainly a lot of success stories, Mexico, Egypt, Southeast Asia, a number of countries there, because we are fundamentally an export-oriented commodity. You know, over 60% of the U.S. soy complex, whether it's beans, meal, or oil, is ultimately exported. As we look to next year, and we look at USDA's projection for total U.S. whole bean exports, you know, 56.5 million metric tons, down from this season, but this season is really a banner year for exports, 56.5 million million tons next year is certainly a pretty large and nice volume. And even with that reduction in exports relative to this year, it still gives us a, a very low projected carryout at the end of the 21-22 marketing year. That is Mac Marshall, Vice President of Market Intelligence with the United Soybean Board as he joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and to finish out this Thursday edition, it's our weekly horticulture segment, and addressing a prime question that any number of home vegetable gardeners are bringing to the attention of our guest, Ward Upham is here, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension, and you're hearing it from at least some growers, Ward, that they have bountiful growing garden plants out there, but they're not setting fruit. And this is not all that uncommon, actually, you say? No, it's not, especially with the cucurbit. So that's going to be the cucumber, squash, watermelon, muskmelon, pumpkin, all of those vining crops. What a lot of people don't realize is all those first flowers are male. Those Mm. plants have both male and female flowers. Mm. And so in order to get fruit, you've got to have both. And so since those first flowers are all male, you just have to wait for the female flowers to develop. And how does one tell the difference here? Yeah, it's really not hard. You just have to look closely right behind the flower and there'll be a miniature fruit right there. And so if if you're not sure, it's a male flower because it is obvious what you have. Like on cucumbers, there's a little prickly little cucumber right behind that flower. It's female. If not, it's just a little stem. So not hard to tell the difference, but a lot of people don't look at their flowers close enough to even have noticed that. But you say there might be another problem at work here, lack of pollination. Yeah, lack of pollination is possible. Not very common, but it can happen. If you've got female flowers and male flowers and you're not getting any fruit, then what you want to do is hand pollinate some of those flowers. Just pick a male flower off and use it to hand pollinate the female flower and then mark it. You know, put some tape on it or something like that so you know which one that you actually hand pollinated. Do several of those and then compare them to those that were not hand pollinated. And if you don't have any that were not hand pollinated developed fruit, you've got a pollinator problem. And a problem that one might have instigated themselves by misuse of insecticide treatments. That's right. Bees are very sensitive to some of our insecticides. You have to be careful how you use them, especially on these vine crops. One of the things that is recommended is that you wait late in the evening before you spray. All these cucurbits, all these vine crops are going to close their flowers about dusk. And then you can spray... And when those flowers open in the morning, they're not going to have any insecticide on the inside of the flowers, and your pollinators will be fine. So manage accordingly, and that may answer your questions about cucurbit crops and why they're not setting fruit. Let's talk tomatoes, though. Another common vegetable that sometimes isn't setting fruit with the regularity that growers would prefer. That's right. And on a lot of years, it's temperature that's the problem. 
early in the season, if you have temperatures below 50 degrees, you usually don't get fruit, or if it does produce fruit, it's going to be deformed. Later in the season, when it starts to get hot, if you have night temperatures above 75, day temperatures 95 and above, that can interfere with pollination as well. That pollen grain has to form a pollen tube to go down and fertilize the egg, and it literally explodes if that temperature is too high. Hmm. And therefore, if we have a hot summer, then that can interfere with pollination. This year, at least in the Manhattan area, looks to be pretty good. I mean, we had a hot period earlier, and this week we'll have like one day of really hot temperatures, but that's not going to cause a real big problem. So if you're less than 95, you're probably going to be fine as far as temperature is concerned. It's those string of multiple hot days that are the issues there. That's right. Yep. Yep. There might also, though you say, Ward, be another reason why that fruit set isn't taking place with any kind of due speed on tomatoes, and that is over-fertilization of the plants? Very common on tomatoes. It can happen on other vegetable crops as well. You have to watch not giving them too much, especially nitrogen, or it can interfere with pollination. But tomatoes are the poster child for this problem. And so if you have a very nice, very healthy-looking tomato plant, and very few flowers or no flowers, and even those flowers that are there don't set fruit, you've probably over-fertilized. So stop the fertilization regime and allow it to burn through that nitrogen, and once it gets through it, then it'll start actually setting fruit. And by all means, don't add nitrogen in your regular waterings at that point. That's right. So some people are going to mix it with water and then water that plant every week, and that's where you get into trouble. All right. Well, you say that there may be an oddity or two happening out there related to pollination, what you're calling weird-looking fruit. What's, yeah. what's the story there? So this is, again, on the cucurbit, so the squash, cucumbers, melons, all that type of thing, where people plant one thing and what comes out of the ground, as far as fruit is concerned, doesn't look like what they planted, okay? And what they want to know is, what did it cross with? So I got the weird fruit on this plant. Well, that type of fruit is determined genetically by the mother plant. So it's not that it crossed with anything. Not that doesn't going to affect that fruit at all. However, if you save seed from those plants and plant it the next year, you don't know what you're going to get because then that cross-pollination does make a difference. And so that's one of the reasons you can get that. One reason is that you save seed and what you planted had already crossed the previous year. Possible also with commercial packages of seed, but that's really, really rare. And then the other possibilities are, are one, you forgot what you planted. <laughs> I have run into that before. I said, go back and look at that seed packet and see what the picture looks like. And in some cases, it looks just exactly like the fruit. They just forgot what they planted. And a third one is that they planted that type of plant there in the same area the year before. And you had a fruit that rotted. And this is a volunteer from the previous year. Again, you're going to have something that you may not recognize. That might give one pause to think about not planting diverse plant types next to each other and uh, maybe encouraging cross-pollination. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, as long as you're not saving seed, you're fine. So you can plant two different types of squash right next to each other. If you're saving seed, it's going to be a problem. You can get around it just by uh, making sure that those flowers are not bee pollinated. You can put them inside a bag while they're open, hand pollinate, make sure that bag is back on there so to keep the bees out. So you can do it, but it's a lot of work. But again, if you're not saving seed, you can plant any type of squash right next to any other type of squash and it's not going to be a problem. And as far as palatability of these, quote, weird fruit, no issues there, you say? Yeah, I mean, they may not taste, they may taste a little funny, but they're not poisonous. People will often ask, is it going to poison me if I eat this? No, it's not. It's going to be fine, but it may not taste what you expect it to taste like. All right. Well, there are some tips on monitoring your fruit set on your various vegetables out there and uh, being sure that you get adequate pollination through some simple management steps. Ward, we appreciate the update. Thank you, you bet. Ward Up, I'm with us, horticulturist, K-State Research and Extension. That is this week's horticulture segment, closing out today's broadcast. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.